This is Cynthia Kanaki with the ALS Association. Thank you so much for carving time out of your day to join us for our monthly educational topic call series. We are wrapping up addressing some technical difficulties. If you would stand by, please. Thank you. Thank you. Wait, too long. <clears throat> I sounded like my navigation system there. <laughs> Changes in like the sound of the speaker. So she left me. Ginger, you want to come back? You always go come back. You always go come back. The conference has been muted. Yeah, the only number I see is 202-464-8614. Uh, this is Cynthia Kanaki with the ALS Association. Thank you for joining us. Today we are presenting one of our regular scheduled Living with ALS educational topic calls. We are addressing some technical difficulties. Please stand by.
Good afternoon, this is Cynthia Kanaki with the ALS Association. Thank you for joining us for our regularly scheduled educational topic call this month. We are addressing some technical difficulties. Please stand by. Good afternoon, this is Cynthia Kanaki. Thank you for um, holding by while we address some technical difficulties. Our guest speaker is here to join us. Wade, can you, um, can you say something so I can identify your line and get you unmuted? The conference has been unmuted. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Wade, can you tell me what telephone number you are calling in from, please? It's the 800-768-2983. Or we want to know my cell phone number. number. My phone number? Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, sorry. sorry, I missed Thank you. your 402-730-1768. Sorry, I misunderstood your message. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The conference has been muted. And good afternoon. This is Cynthia Kanachi with the ALS Association. Thank you for your patience in joining us today while we address some technical um, issues. Today's webinar is one of a series of webinars designed to bring information of a practical nature to people living with ALS. And we're very pleased to have as a guest speaker Wade Lucas. Wade is a doctoral physical therapist. He is also an ATP. And Mr. Lucas is the Clinical Education Manager of the Western U.S. with Quantum Rehab. I don't want to give your time, so Wade, I understand you are on the call. Um, please move forward. Okay. Thank you, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on the, on the webinar today. Uh, like Cynthia said, my name is Wade Lucas, and I'm a, a physical therapist and, and one of the Clinical Education Managers for Quantum Rehab. Um, and today we're going to talk about uh, the critical components and accessories uh, that can enhance and prolong function for a person using a power wheelchair. So what is the first thing that you may think of when you hear the word power wheelchair? Well, I think, I think most people would say that it's a device used to get a person from one place to another. They are typically prescribed for independent, safe, and timely mobility for a person to go uh, from point A to point B in order to complete their activities of daily living. While this is true, it is really the critical components that can allow the individual uh, to have safe and functional mobility throughout the entire day. Critical components are devices that are often medically necessary um, for safety, positioning, and access to various environments. We will also, during this webinar, take a look at some other accessories as well that may not necessarily be deemed as medically necessary, but still have a uh, additional safety and quality of life impact for the person using the power wheelchair. With that in mind, it's important to remember a couple things. And that is with all the components that we're about to discuss today in this webinar, they not, not all of these devices are always required and appropriate for everyone. Just like every individual is unique, the, the power wheelchair system, including the, the seating system and all of its accessories, need to, be, you need to be unique in order to meet the needs of the person. So there, with that being said, just remember, there is not one single set of, of equipment that's appropriate for everyone. It's truly um, as unique as the individual. 
So how do we determine what is appropriate and necessary for each individual? Well, it starts with a direct assessment by a knowledgeable and trained clinician, along with a skilled medical equipment supplier with the knowledge of all of the equipment. This, but this uh, assessment, after this assessment and the completion of clinical trials as appropriate, um, it is necessary to complete the necessary documentation in order to, to submit to a person's insurance. Then, of course, we have to set what are the person's goals, what are the goals for the rehab team, and by using evidence-based practice, we can, we can use that information to determine what equipment is best for the individual. So what does that rehab professional and that, clinic, and that supplier looking for during the clinical assessment? Well, a thorough assessment involves a number of different things. First of all, does a person have any range of motion restrictions or postural asymmetries that must be addressed? We also must look for any primitive or abnormal reflexes that can be present, which affects the person's, not only affects the person's posture, but also can affect their ability to control the power wheelchair. And a, a thorough assessment of the person's balance and postural reactions can help determine the amount of support that the person may need. An assessment of their muscle tone, whether it be low tone or increased tone um, for different individuals, can be a, also plays an important role in the um, postural support selection. If the person has impaired or absent sensation, then this puts them at a higher risk for pressure injuries. And so thus it's important to assess what risk factors does the person present with for their skin to protect their skin and also a thorough evaluation actually looking at the skin for any signs or symptoms of, of pressure injuries to start with. It is also important to discuss any history of open wounds or any, any kind of pressure injuries on the seating surface um, up at the very beginning during that evaluation. This is another important uh, risk factor um, for future pressure injuries if, if the person has already has a history of it. Nutrition and hydration is also important um, for not only main maintaining skin health, but it's also vital for healing of any current pressure injuries. We also must be aware of any medications that can play a role uh, in a number of ways, including the, if it affects the person's level of alertness, their safety, tolerance of sitting, and potential changes in muscle tone. We also want to look at does the person require any kind of bracing or splints that may be, uh, be used as additional supports, whether it be at the trunk for postural control or in the upper extremities to assist in controlling the wheelchair. Uh, we also must assess the person's cognition and their motor planning skills um, for safe use of the equipment. We also must assess the person's strength along with their range of motion and the endurance that the muscles have um, for driver, driver control access, positional support, and to ensure function throughout the entire day. Pain also affects function. So the location and causes of any pain must be considered in setting up the different aspects and different accessories of the wheelchair. We also must make sure that the person's vision and hearing are adequate to safely use and function in the wheelchair. And finally, um, last but not least, we need to make sure they will be taking some measurements. And these measurements are used to ensure um, the proper setup and equipment selection of the entire seating system. So once that thorough, or as the thorough evaluation is going on, the, the clinician and the ATP supplier are keeping a few things in mind. And here we list six of those things. The first consideration is, is in the principles of seating and ultimately the goals um, for the seating system and the mobility device is the first one is we wanna make sure that we're setting the person up to optimize their function. Um, this is done by providing a stable base or a foundation, particularly at the pelvis, at the lower extremities, and at the trunk. By providing stability at each of these locations, it allows us to have more dexterity and more function 
at the upper extremities, including the arms, hands, and also for the head and neck. Second of all, we want to make sure that we're uh, minimizing orthopedic deformities. While not all postural asymmetries can be avoided, it, an important goal is to correct these deformities as able and then support the body to prevent further progression of these asymmetries. Asymmetries and orthopedic deformities can lead to a variety of different complications down the road um, with not including pressure ulcer formation and difficulties breathing. Those are just, a, just to name a few. Third, we want to maximize the weight distribution to decrease pressure. And we do this by, by spreading out the pressure between the person's sitting surface and the cushion. By spreading this pressure out over a larger surface area, we can decrease the risk of pressure injuries. Next on the list, as far as seating principles is concerned, is we want to make sure that we maintain vital body functions. Positioning plays a huge role in how the body functions. Um, and some of these body functions that we're looking at is cardiopulmonary functioning. Um, we also want to maintain position to allow the person to eat, swallow, breathe easier, digest their food, and for bowel and bladder control. Next, we want to maximize visual, perceptual, and cognitive abilities. As mentioned previously, being upright and supported well allows the person um, visual, perceptual, and cognitive stimulation um, by being able to see and interact with their environment. And last and certainly not least, this may be the most important seating principle, especially from the, the side of the person actually sitting in the wheelchair is the the comfort, we want to maximize their comfort, and maximizing comfort increases their sitting tolerance, allows them to tolerate being in the chair for much longer periods of time. Um, if the person's not comfortable, they will not tolerate sitting up and will likely lead to disuse of this, this equipment. Thus, we're taking away um, the, uh, a great opportunity for mobility and, and independent functioning. So with that being said, let's, let's move on and discuss some of these, these accessories and critical components specifically. And the first thing, the one I'd like to start off with is cushions. And when we use cushions, there are three main reasons that we use these. Um, cushions are used for, of course, comfort. It's a softer surface than sitting on um, a standard kind of vinyl or sling seating or a solid hard seat pan. So we, we want to make sure that the, the cushion is made out of materials that um, are soft, comfortable, and distributes pressure well. Um, along with comfort, the cushions aid in positioning. You'll see many different cushions with many different shapes and sizes. As you can see here, it's pictured um, on the top. The cushion is, has a little bit of contour, but overall um, it's, it's much flatter, less much less contour than the other cushion that's below it. This cushion below has some sh extra shape. It has a higher front end versus the back end to help keep the pelvis back and the lower extremities positioned well. Um, it also has some contours to really support um, the femurs and the, and the thighs. And thirdly, we use cushions for pressure relief. All right, And cushions come in, along with coming in various shapes and sizes, they come in a, a variety of different materials as well, from different foams, gels, and even air pockets. The, the type of cushion, again, is determined during that thorough evaluation by the clinician and by the, the um, trained supplier or experienced supplier um, based on those evaluation results. Okay. All right, the next, next critical component that we're going to discuss is backrest. And again, note that there are a variety of different shapes and sizes available in backrest. Wheelchair backrests are designed to provide support not only for our trunk, but it also helps support our pelvis. By supporting the pelvis, it helps to provide a stable foundation and gives us a, um, a good supported base 
to help position and maintain function throughout the different throughout the other body segments. Backrests also help provide uh, lateral trunk support, which will help the person from leaning or prevent the person from leaning to the side. It also allows the attachment of adjustable lateral supports, as you can see in these two bottom pictures here. We on the right side we have a, a top view of different depths and different amount of lateral support that, it, that are built into the backrest. Um, to the left of that, we have an example of a backrest that has um, separate lateral supports that are attached to that backrest that allows the different um, adjustments of height and different adjustments of width in order to give to really fine tune and, and uh, give the maximum amount of support with those lateral supports. And then we can move on to the lateral supports. And when we're talking about going to lateral supports that aren't built into the um, the, the backrest already, um, these lateral supports tend to be more adjustable, and they um, they're more supportive. They can be more adjusted. And as you can see on this picture on the left, they can be offset for really dialing in where those lateral supports need to be positioned. This also allows us to provide um, three points of contact, which is it's significantly important and oftentimes overlooked when we're, we're trying to support the person in a nice, stable seating system in the, in the wheelchair. We really need, um, when the person is leaning, or as you can see in this picture, it's kind of a, um, a lateral scoliosis of the spine, we need those lateral supports. Um, we need two supports on the side that they're leaning towards and a counteracting force from the lateral on, on the opposite side. We also have lateral supports down here on the bottom right that are designed to help support at the hips, at the thighs, or at the knees. Um, for the lateral hip and thigh guides, um, there's a variety of different, different types of pads, different lengths of pads, different adjustable hardware for this, but this, again, helps position not only the pelvis, but can help position the lower extremities as they're uh, sitting in the wheelchair. Positioning belts are also a very key critical component used to provide um, support at the pelvis and the trunk. Notice that I'm using the term positioning belt versus seat belt. Um, positioning belts are, and harnesses are designed to be positioned in a very specific location um, with a very, uh, very specific direction of pull. Um, they're not seat belts. Seat belts are in vehicles, so think of it as this. So these are really positioning belts. They're designed to be positioned at a very specific angle. As you can see here on the left-hand side, we have a red line here representing a uh, positioning belt at the pelvis. So this is designed to kind of pull down and pull backwards in order to help keep the pelvis back and in an ideal neutral position. There are a variety of different belts and uh, positioning belts for the pelvis out on the market. There's a couple different examples here on the bottom which are, are considered a two-point belt because they have two points of connection to the um, wheelchair base. Um, above that, we have an example of a four-point harness which it has four points of um, attachment to the wheelchair base, which adds a little bit of extra, gives us two angles of control, and, and is really designed for those individuals with high, high tone or, um, or individuals that were unable to keep their pelvis in a neutral position by just providing those two points of contact. Um, as you can see over here on the right is an example of what we would typically describe as an H-type shoulder harness. And there's different shapes and different uh, sizes and different materials of these as well. Some are this H uh, style. Well, we also have uh, Y-shaped styles that have an attachment point below the shoulder on one side and then kind of splits and comes around um, the opposite shoulder. Um, and then we also have this two-point harnesses that go around the chest. And these are really designed to help um, secure the person back into the backrest and, and prevent them from losing their balance or, or falling forward.
All right. And next we'll talk a little bit about head supports or headrests. And these are key component, components that provide support to the head and neck, not only during mobility, but also when we're using power positioning. And power positioning are, uh, components are what we're going to talk about next. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Um, again, just like with the backs, cushions, and, and belts, there are many different types of head supports out there on the market. They come in various shapes. They come in various sizes. And they can also, as you can see in this picture on the right, there are additional uh, supports that are available depending on what the individual's support needs are. If, they're, um, if just having a single rear pad is not enough, we can add supports that under kind of the base of the skull, as you see here on the, on the right-hand side. We can also have uh, pads that come around to the lateral and even swing uh, kind of in the front of the head as well to really, really support that head. And again, the shape, size, and the amount of support is again determined based on that, that thorough evaluation by the, the clinician and the um, equipment supplier. All right, so those are, those are the uh, main positioning supports that, uh, that we consider um, for anyone using the power wheelchair. So we have our, our cushions, our backs, our uh, positioning belts, our lateral supports, and our headrests. With that being said, now let's, let's move on to power positioning. And power positioning um, is a very important component, and it's, an, it's a component and an option that allows the person uh, to independently change their position or independently change the position of their body in space. And the first power positioning device that I want to uh, discuss is, and for some reason, I had a little animation on this, but it apparently did not uh, transfer over. But um, if the animation on this slideshow were, were working, um, what the tilt is, is actually it maintains um, power tilt allows the person to be tilted back up to 55 degrees by maintaining uh, the trip to, uh, trunk to hip angle. So basically what would occur is that the, all the angles at the hips, the angles at the hips and at the knees will not change and that base or that seating system of the chair will tip, tip backwards to 55 degrees. And when we use tilt, um, this is mainly used to decrease pressure on the seated surface and thus decreasing the risk of pressure injuries. Um, please note that the power positioning device alone is not, or a cushion alone, is not adequate for um, pressure management. Um, if the person has been determined as a person that's a high risk for pressure injuries, then it's highly recommended that a combination of cushion and power positioning um, be utilized to effectively um, limit that risk of pressure injuries. So back to the t uh, power tilt more specifically. Um, power tilt, along with decreasing the effects of uh, pressure injuries, it also allows uh, the uh, gravity to assist in positioning of the individual. And having the individual tilt back as little as even 5 to 10 degrees can help decrease postural demands of the, postural, uh, of, of the person's posture. So if you're sitting in the chair and you're sitting upright against gravity, that's making the body work extremely hard just to hold the person upright. By using the power wheelchair controls and tilting back just slightly, then we take gravity as kind of a, a hindrance to our posture into a helper. And this gravity-assisted uh, positioning um, will help increase the sitting tolerance by decreasing the amount of fatigue and the work that the the individual's body has to do to support itself. Um, it also increases the person's visual field. It helps aid their breathing, speech generation. It's much easier to swallow and also to digest the food. The next power positioning device is recline. And power recline is a device that allows the trunk to recline back and open up the trunk to hip angle. One thing to note that is it extremely important to utilize power legs, which we were going to talk about here in just a couple minutes, um, 
a power elevating leg rest be used with power recline too, or as well. If you can imagine if you were to, to sit in your um, lazy boy recliner at home and you were to recline back without raising your leg up, legs up, um, that would not be very comfortable. That position um, puts the person's hip muscles on stretch and their pelvis is pulled forward and it, it increases the um, posterior pelvic tilt, which when your pelvis tilts, you get increased um, shearing and you also get increased pressure on your tailbone and we don't, and we don't want that. Okay. So we wanna make sure that we're including the uh, lower leg elevation in with the recline system as well. Okay. So the recline um, also has many of the same benefits as the tilting system, and that is um, it helps decrease the uh, risk for pressure injuries. Uh, it helps improve uh, bladder function. Um, if you think of uh, the body when it's when you're in a sitting position and we're we're bent, it's kind of it's kind of kinking the hose, so to speak. By by reclining back, it helps open up. Um, you unkink the hose, and it allows the fluids in the body to more easily transport from the upper to lower body. Um, recline will also help with independent repositioning for increased sitting tolerance. Um, it allows the person to change the joint angles at the hips and at the knees with the power elevating leg rest. So this can help maintain, keep the range of motion loose, keep the um, joints moving. It also can be used for um, tone or spasticity management, which um, you know, can occur in, in various neurological conditions. By reclining back, that also helps increase the person's visual field. And just like with the tilt, it also offers that gravity-assisted positioning for um, decreased postural demands and thus increasing their um, postural control. It helps with speech generation, breathing, um, and swallowing and digestion as well. One thing that, or a couple things to consider when we're talking about recline is we have to consider um, shear forces that occur. So if you imagine, if you, if you, when you start to recline back, um, the person will, the person's buttocks and back will slide down and it will slide down in relationship to the actual backrest and the cushion. And as you can see in this picture here, the person's body is moving down and in relationship to the seating surface, it is moving up. And this causes a, a frictional force between the patient's back and buttocks um, and the back and seat of the wheelchair. Um, when you have this friction going on, especially over the bony prominences, so bony, the bony prominences in the pelvis, like your sitting bones or your ischial tuberosity, your tailbone, and then also the, the main uh, bones that are sticking out of the back of your spine can get this shearing effect. And when you have this, this shear effect, um, it actually can be uh, significantly more damaging than pressure itself. So we really want to try to, um, that's why it's so important for uh, a, a thorough assessment and, and stabilizing the pelvis and recommending the, the positioning, uh, power positioning components and educating on using them properly to really decrease um, the amount of shear that exists. And even though uh, we can't ever really completely eliminate shear um, from seating, we can definitely um, make some recommendations and, and provide equipment that will significantly decrease it. And one of those ways, and again, I'm, uh, I'm sorry for the um, animation did not come through, um, but with this, this slide, what's, what's supposed to happen is we wanna make sure um, that we first tilt and the, the chair on the right, on the left-hand side, uh, the animation would tilt back. So we wanna make sure that the individual tilts back first to at least 25 degrees and then reclines. What this does is it allows gravity to help keep the person all the way back in the chair, keeps their pelvis back, keeps their trunk back, keeps their shoulders back, it keeps their head back um, before reclining. So if you recline back, um, 
most reclining systems have up to 55 degrees of tilt. And so if you think about you want to at least tilt back halfway or about 25 degrees um, before you start to recline. Once you've reclined and you've, you've done your pressure relief or you've rested um, and then you want to come back upright to drive, you want to make sure that you do the opposite. You want to make sure that you recline back up first and then tilt. And by doing it in that specific order will greatly decrease the amount of, of shear that you're putting the body at risk for. All right. And then we'll move moving on to um, power elevating legs. Again, as mentioned before, it's important to, um, this is a critical component that is absolutely vital to be used alongside uh, recline. Um, just because of the, the positioning and sitting tolerance and the, decreasing, the decrease of shearing uh, and pressure on the, um, the tailbone. And there are two different types of leg rests that are available out there on the market. And uh, the first is probably the most common one that you, that you see and is most commonly recommended, and that's the power articulating foot platform. And that's the device that um, attaches to the bottom of the seat and it has just the leg rests are attached together and it ha just has a single platform. And as you can see, there are lots of different accessories, different uh, calf pads and different additions that you can make to um, adjust the size of the plate. Um, but the benefit of this power articulating foot platform is that it makes the overall turning radius of the chair um, smaller and thus more maneuverable. Um, it also allows for um, you can flip both foot plates up at one time or a one-step operation for getting them out of the way to transfer. And then it also increases access to different surfaces. It allows you to get closer to tables, to sinks, to countertops, um, and that sort of thing because the, the leg rests aren't sticking out quite as far. Um, as, if you look at the picture below and you look at the separate power elevating leg rests, um, the benefits of these is it allows us, um, you'll see these, these are not linked together, together. They're actually separated. They can be uh, swung out of the way to get completely out of the way for some, when someone needs to transfer. Um, they also allow for the individual to um, adjust their legs uh, separately or independently. They don't have to, um, with the articulating foot platform, if you're going to raise your legs up, um, they both go up. If in the uh, independent leg rest, you can raise one up, or if you have some sort of asymmetrical, or if you have range of motion differences from one side to another, this may be a, a better option. Um, on the negative side, they are um, much bigger. They stick out um, a bit further, and they also, it makes the turning radius and accessibility to the in environment um, a little bit less advantageous. All right, so with that in mind, after talking about and discussing all three of those uh, power positioning options with power tilt, uh, recline, and power elevating leg rest, ultimately what we want to think about is being able to use all three of those devices together. And again, remember I said at the very beginning there's no um, one set seating system for, for every individual. Again, it's really a part of that thorough evaluation and determination of the person's needs. Um, but from, um, but there, are, there are several benefits that need to be considered um, for using all three of these functions. And the first one being um, that combining the tilt and the, with 25 to 45 degrees of tilt, and then reclining back to 110 to 150 degrees of recline um, gives us the greatest amount of pressure relief. So it's the, it's the optimal for the most pressure relief. So someone that's very high risk for potential uh, pressure injuries, we want to consider using um, all these functions. Uh, we want to make sure, again, like we talked on the previous slides, we want to make sure that we tilt before we recline to decrease the, the effect of shear. Um, utilizing all three of these functions can help the caregiver. Um, it can 
it can help the person be more independent with their repositioning, or it can also help the caregiver um, not have to be at higher risk by moving the person around so the person can tilt, recline, elevate their legs. And if the person needs to be adjusted in the wheelchair, um, the caregiver can do that much easier under this position. Also, if you notice uh, that the position, when it's tilted all the way back, reclined back, and the leg rests are elevated, that the legs can be positioned significantly higher than the level of the person's heart. And this is what's necessary if the person has um, significant edema or swelling in, in their lower extremities. So this is a, um, a great means to uh, help accommodate some of that and resolve some of that edema. It also allows um, dynamic positioning changes or seating changes um, to allow the person to participate and perform their activities of daily living. So it's a really good use of all three of those functions, has a lot of, lot of benefit to the power wheelchair user. All right, so the next power positioning device that we're gonna talk about is power adjustable seat height. And again, I'm, I apologize for the animation um, not, not coming through, but this would show that this, the seat, the seating system and the leg rest would, would rise up and, and elevate. So this um, can change the surface, um, the surface height or the, the seat to floor height of the chair. And it's very beneficial for a variety of reasons. First, by being able to elevate the seat, it can um, be important for completing transfers. So if the person has trouble sitting, going from a sit to a stand from a lower surface, the, the seat can be adjusted to a height that makes it easier for the person to transfer. It can also decrease the amount of work and the amount of strain um, on the caregiver if that person needs assist with that sit to stand component as well. Also by elevating, being able to adjust the seat height or raise it up, and in this particular model, most power adjustable seat heights will elevate um, 10 to 12 inches, depending on um, the, the model, the make and model of the, of the base. But that power adjustable seat height will also help augment function uh, for reach limitations. So it allows a person to reach up into closets, reach up into overhead cabinets, reach up into the freezer or um, at work or at school or whatever the case may be. It augments that reach and helps, um, you know, meal preparation, um, again, assisting transfers for those ADLs onto maybe a toilet, onto, onto bed, onto a uh, tub bench, whatever the case may be. The power adjustable seat height also has been shown to decrease the amount of strain on the person's neck. When a person is, is sitting low in the chair and they're, and they're um, in order to converse or socialize or to speak with an individual, they have to extend their neck and look up constantly. This has been shown to lead to you know, significant neck pain, headaches, that sort of thing. So by having that power adjustable seat height can uh, decrease those physiological um, strains from, from that prolonged and repeated position. It also has uh, the psychological benefits of being able to um, make eye-to-eye -eye contact instead of having to look up during conversations. Um, it helps with communication and then also social en engagement as well. All right, so, so those are the, end of the four main power positioning um, devices that are um, awful, often uh, critical and, and necessary uh, for function and safety and, and independence. So now we want to look at some of the options, accessories, and critical components from, all right, how do we control the power wheelchair? How do we control the chair from going from point A to point B? And how do we control the wheelchair to utilize these power positioning devices? How do we utilize, independently utilize the tilt, the recline, the elevating legs, and the power adjustable seat height? So again, part of the, part of the therapist and supplier's role in this evaluation will be determining which drive control gives the person the, the most control over their mobility and power positioning. Uh, this decision, again, 
is based on the evaluation results. Uh, typically, the exam and trial begin with a standard joystick, and that's what we see most common. And as you'll see on the next slide, we're talking on the far left, the top left, that's our typical standard joystick. But there's times when that joystick is just not a, a reasonable means of um, mobility for an individual, and they may be, need some alternate types of driver controls. So where do we go um, after that? Well, we have lots of, lots of different choices. Um, first of all, we have different mounting options uh, for, the, for the joysticks. Um, we have chin controls. We have, we have different sorts of trays. Um, we also have different shapes and different shapes and sizes of the joystick handles that can be used to accommodate. We can use different joystick mounts to bring it into a different position other than just straight in, in line with the armrest. We can position it more close to the body or more midline or um, just in a variety of different places. Um, so along with the mounting shape of joysticks, we can also use, there's a variety of different joysticks out there and the different joysticks, what makes them unique is they all have a different uh, amount of movement or how far that the device must be pushed in order to um, get a full what we call a joystick deflection or how far the joystick must move and they also require uh, a variable diff amounts of force in order to um, to make the joystick move for example if you look at the jo the standard joystick that joystick requires about 250 grams of force to make that joystick move versus um, one that may be, in, you'll see in the bottom left here, the um, chin control mount with the joystick, we can have a, jo a joystick that requires as little as 8.5 grams of force, or the one right next to it requires about 50 grams of force. So we have lots of different options depending on, again, looking at the person's strength their range of motion, and the level of endurance that their muscles have to, to make that decision. I'm going to go back to this, this previous slide because when we were talking about the joysticks, we were talking about uh, proportional controls. And what a pro we have two different types of control options. We have proportional or we have our non-proportional or what we call digital or switch controls. And the big difference between proportional is that it gives us 360 degrees of control. So if we have a joystick, we can move it around in that complete circle. We can go forward, left, right, reverse. We can go diagonal, and we can go every degree in between. It also allows us to control the speed um, by if we press the joystick just a little bit, we're just gonna, we're gonna go slow. And the further that we move that joystick, the faster that the, the chair is going to move. And then we stop by returning the device to center or just letting go. So that is a um, proportional controls are, tend to be the most intuitive and the most efficient device. Um, but there are often times where that's not an option and, and proportional controls aren't going to be the, the way to give the person the most um, effective means of mobility. And in that case, we move to a digital or a switch control, which basically a, a switch control is just like a light switch. It's either on or off. We, we take different types of switches or position switches in different places, and we assign a, a direction to each switch. So we would have a switch to go forward. We'd have one to go right. We'd have one to go left. We'd have one to go reverse, um, potentially have another switch to operate our, our seating functions to be able to access our tilt or recline or power elevating legs. All right. And again, switch uh, stopping is, is typically done by releasing that switch. So here are on this slide we have I have some different examples which we looked at some different examples of proportional controls anywhere from our our standard joystick to some of our what we call mini joysticks or joysticks that require less force, um, different shapes and sizes and different mounting hardware. When we look at our switch controls, 
Um, we have a variety of different options as well. And we, we also have four different types of, of switches that may be determined by the clinician or the, the supplier to be the best um, options for an individual. And we have some, the different switches that we have available. Is a, a, one is a mechanical switch, which is essentially a button. Um, we can mount buttons in, in a variety of different places. It can be mounted at, um, at the person's hand, on a tray, um, on a headrest, um, on a, a swing away mount on the headrest. We can mount it at the knees, at the foot, wherever we need it. And mechanical switches are nice because when you press it, you can feel that it's pressed down. And oftentimes you can hear that auditory click to know that it's been activated. So that's one of the advantages. One of the disadvantages of mechanical switches is that it re does require some force and some strength to depress. And different switches have different uh, amounts of force required to um, def deflect it. And so, again, that's another characteristic that's, um, that's discussed and, and evaluated during that evaluation. Um, another type of switch is a pneumatic switch, which basically is a um, one that is activated by breath control. And it is activated either by um, puffing in through the straw or um, sipping in through the straw. And so we can either um, drive the chair or we can um, access the power positioning devices through um, breath support or breath control. Proximity switches, and this is on the left here, you can see what a proximity switch looks like. Oftentimes these switches are mounted. Um, in this example on the right, there's a headrest and there's a proximity switch mounted in each one of those three pads on that, on that head control or what we would call a head array. And a, what a proximity switch is, is it doesn't require any force. It requires a battery supply from the power wheelchair, but it only requires that the person get um, the body part close to that switch. So it, once it gets within a certain distance, it activates the switch and the chair um, provides, an, provides an output. Um, so a proximity switch is a, a fairly common type of switch that we use um, to control uh, power wheelchairs because they do not require any force to activate those switches. And lastly, on the right bottom here, we have a fiber optic switch, which again is a, uh, a power required um, switch, but it's a, a beam of red light that once that beam is, is covered or um, it, that beam is quote unquote broken, um, the beam is sent back into it and it activates a switch. So as soon as you get close enough to that beam and cover it, you can see here it's an example uh, of a person that uses her thumb to cover that switch. Once she covers that switch, it provides an output onto the chair. So again, it's a nice option um, for, for, it doesn't require any kind of force. It can be mounted in, in very small, very precise locations. And it re really requires very minimal um, range of motion and very minimal strength in order to operate that that type of switch. Okay. All right. So next, after talking of, about switches, it's an, important to um, talk about tracking technology. And basically, what tracking technology is, is it's a feature on the motors of the wheelchair that that basically talks to the control module so that the speed um, of the wheels can change in relationship to one another. And, and basically what tracking technology does is if you're using a switch and you're activating the forward switch and you want to go straight down the, the sidewalk, well, um, you know, most sidewalks, especially over time, um, or streets or different terrains or driveways, um, they're, not, they're not level. And so if you try to go across um, a level surface and it's not really level, if you're just using a switch to go forward, the, the terrain is going to veer the chair off course. And what this tracking technology does is it, it, it will, the motors will sense that different, um, that veering. It'll send a message to the controller, which will send it back to the motors to kick in the appropriate motor and maintain that straight path and not require that individual using a head control or switches at the knees or the, the legs to repeatedly make those driving corrections. 
not necessarily um, all overly useful for proportional controls all the time because oftentimes if we're using that joystick, we can make those those minor corrections with very minimal very minimal movement. But with uh, switch controls, it's a more significant movement and repeated movement in order to make that correction. So it can really um, help provide a safe, accurate operation of the chair and minimize the need for those excessive movements um, at whatever body part is, is controlling the chair. So important feature to, to consider when using uh, those switch controls. Um, some other accessories just to kind of to go through quick that may be recommended depending on um, the person's needs. Um, the res respiratory support devices are um, available and can be attached to the wheelchair. This includes um, an oxygen tank holder if that is required to help support respiratory function and also a ventilator tray. So if the person um, using the power wheelchair requires a ventilator um, either full-time or for part of the day, this device can be attached to the, the back of the chair um, and can still provide them with the uh, mobility and the accessibility to the, in, in, to the environment. We also have uh, transit tie-downs. Um, and transit tie-downs are available on the wheelchair in, in two, different, two different types. We can have our occupied and our unoccupied transit options. So depending how the, the person and the caregivers are going to transport the chair. Um, we have an unoccupied option, which is meant that if you're not going to ride in the wheelchair while, while the car is in motion, or we have an ocu occupied system that um, involves a, um, a restraint belt over the seat uh, that, that the, allows the person to be able to sit in the wheelchair um, while they're transported. So again, um, a couple options that may be in, important for that uh, person to have on their on their wheelchair. Uh, optional, uh, we also have light packages, and we have two different versions of the light packages. The um, I'm going to talk about the one on the right first, and as you can see, this is kind of a picture of the front light, uh, what's called the fender lights. And you can see the little uh, white LED light on the top and the red LED light on the on the bottom. These are actually um, included, um, at least in the in the quantum chair. These fender lights are in, included, um, and no extra upcharge or any extra um, out of pocket expense. These are mainly for um, visibility. And when you're using their chair out in the community and it starts to get starting to get dark out, it just makes the person more visible increases the safety, not necessarily intended for like headlights, where if you have the light package, the full light package, which is an, um, an upcharge, um, which is uh, not typically a covered item through insurances, but um, it gives you a more significant light. You can use it more like a, a headlight. You can use it as um, blinkers. Um, you also have, not shown in this picture, but you also have the uh, lights um, on the back as well, again, for increasing vision uh, or visibility in the environment, um, and then being able to um, use them as, as headlights just like you would in a, in a vehicle. Another device that's uh, another accessory that may be um, an important option is transfer handles. And as you can see, um, these transfer handles are mounted um, kind of at the, at the outer edge of the, uh, the seat, and it's on the side of the wheelchair on the, um, below the cushion, and it's mounted there. So if the person needs a little bit more optimal or a more ergonomic place to push up to do a sit-to-stand transfer, that these transfer bars are, or these transfer handles are available um, to provide that, that support. We also, there's a variety of different uh, companies out there that offer uh, a variety of different types of phone and tablet holders. Um, obviously, um, with the today's age of, of uh, dependence on <laughs> cellular phones and tablets and, and everything like that, um, it's again, it's important to, for the individual to have that 
mounted to their chair. Um, it allows uh, the power wheelchair user to have access to their cell cellular phone and tablet at all times. Um, obviously, it's important for emergencies. It can be used as for controlling their environment and communication. Um, by having these mounts mounted to the chair, that leads into kind of the, one of the next accessories that's really kind of a, uh, a great feature is if you have access to your, your cell phone or your tablet, all of the different options for um, home automation, environmental controls, controlling uh, TVs, um, controlling thermostats, it makes it all available to that person to control from their wheelchair. Um, one of the things that um, most power wheelchair uh, companies offer these days is uh, Bluetooth and infrared capabilities that are built into the chair. And um, with, with the quantum chairs, we include the Bluetooth is not an upcharge. It is included in the expandable electronics. So if you have um, that expandable controller like that joystick um, that I showed on the one slide, or if you are using an alternative drive control like a head array or a sip and pop, and you have an enhanced display, that Bluetooth and that infrared capabilities are built into the chair. And so then that gives the person the ability to control, um, you know, speech generating or communication devices through their wheelchair controls. It allows the person to operate their computer. You essentially turn the wheelchair controls into a, a computer mouse and you can control your chair, uh, control your computer. You can control your, your smartphone and tablets. Um, and then if you can control your smartphone and tablets, then you have the the different equipment in your home for in, you know all the home automation. So you have the the smart the smart things hub or um, or the Google Home where you can control lights and fans and thermostats and um, all kinds and controlling the TV, um, all sort of different things. Again, these capabilities are built into the electronics and they're there if you if you need them. And lastly, I wanted to. Um, just talk about, obviously, if we have a, a cell phone or a tablet mounted to the chair, we want to make sure that our phone and our tablet um, stay charged. Uh, we have two different options for um, USB chargers to charge those devices, so we always have uh, uh, power to those devices. Um, the one here on the left is a hardwired model. This is actually hardwired into the, um, the, the wheelchair um, power supply and it's mounted um, it can be mounted in a variety of different places typically it's mounted on the um, armrest where uh, the individual can get to it relatively easy if needed um, then we also have the one the one on the right which is a removable um, type of USB charger and this device is um, actually inserted into the charging port on the um, back end of the joystick or on the back of the dis enhanced display. And so um, that, that device is also a um, no, no charge option and is in, included with the expandable electronics. So that device just goes in there. Um, you can plug your USB and your phone into there and, and always have power supply um, to those different devices. So um, with that, um, again, I thank you for your time. And uh, I thank the ALS for allowing uh, Quantum to be um, a participant in this webinar. If anybody has any questions after uh, the webinar or down the road or um, anybody that's uh, listening to this on a recorded, um, you can, if you have any questions, my email is, is listed there. Um, please feel free to, to reach out to me with any questions um, and, and let us know that if, if we can help with anything. And, with that, I will turn it back over to Cynthia. Thank you, Dr. Lucas, um, and thanks so much for your patience this afternoon as we address some technical issues upon opening the webinar. Um, as Dr. Lucas mentioned, this uh, webinar is being recorded, so if you would like a recording of the entire webinar or you would like a copy of the slide deck, uh, they will be available in approximately 24 hours on the ALS Association website. That's ALS. A dot o -R -G. And if you would like me to send you one of these, you simply 
submit your email address in the chat box, and I'll be happy to uh, send the link to you directly. Um, Dr. Lucas, we did have a couple questions, and thanks so much. It um, brings to mind the, the phrase, more than meets the eye, because it's clear that a wide variety of components uh, in power wheelchairs are really critical for maximizing function in someone that's uh, dealing with ALS. We did have a, a couple questions, and I'll just share them with the entire audience here. How do I know when to move from my regular wheelchair to a power wheelchair, and can I add features I don't need now but will need later, or should I include everything from the start? It's a compound question. Okay, um, good question. So that's, again, that's really one of those important um, parts of that that thorough assessment and um, you know I, I, I I'm always been a, a proponent of of talking about it and evaluating it um, you know very early on and um, because you know you don't want to if you if you think that your current mobility device is no longer meeting your mobility needs as soon as you start to have those initial thoughts or questions it, it never hurts to Ask for that referral to see, you know, a wheelchair uh, wheelchair specialist, a clinician that has specialty in, in, in complex rehab in, in wheelchairs. Um, if if for some, even if you know worst case scenario, if if you go to the evaluation and they say, well, no, you're you're it's not it's not time for that type of device or it's not time to change. That's you know the, that's the, you know the worst they can say is no, you're it's, you know not appropriate at this time. You don't you don't really need it right now. Um, but to, just to ask, or you know, to ask for the physician for that evaluation, um, and go and go see that experienced clinician, you know, as soon as as soon as possible. Um, uh, what was the second part of that question? I'm sorry. The second part of that, sure, it was a compound question. Was um, can I add features I don't need now, but will need later, or should I just include everything from the start? Well, and, and the one thing is, is and that a little bit of that is, um, again, a, a part of that evaluation process, because oftentimes people may not think they need a particular option or device at that moment, but in fact, may, maybe they do. And um, it's, it's important to be evaluated and, and to at least consider it, because one thing that's uh, as as clinicians and evaluating clinicians, we must we, we do is we have to try to anticipate what that person is going to need, you know, for the next several years, um, you know, especially when it comes to um, you know the power wheelchair base and the different options. If the person, if we were to prescribe a wheelchair that only meets the person's need now, then you know, if that person changes and in, you know, six months to a year, they need something completely different that can't be adapted, then insurance has to buy a, pay for a whole new device. So they, insurance is, uh, expect us in certain situations to um, recommend equipment that may not necessarily be needed right at this moment, but that it's anticipated to uh, be needed in the future. And so again, um, that's an important discussion to have with those evaluating clinicians and 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 your physicians um, to help determine if that's something that's appropriate at this point. And again, different um, unfortunately, different insurances have different a little bit different policies. Um, you know, like you know, for example, it may be determined that you need a power wheelchair, but you don't need power tilt, uh, recline, and elevating legs at this time. Well, then what they'll typically provide is the power wheelchair base that will um, allow those seating functions to be added later. And so um, while, you know, they, they want to pay for what's now, but we have to make sure that we're prepared for any sort of changes in, in, the, in the future. Great. Thanks so much. And you know, with a, with a disease like ALS that we know is progressive, um, that really is a key factor as people start looking at the equipment that they need. Um, Wade, do we have a question here? 
This is a great question. You, you talked about a variety of different ways to control the chair, um, but this viewer shared this question. Is there a way for the caregiver to control the care if the patient cannot for any reason? Yes, and there is a, an option, and that's, a, that's one accessory that I, that's a good point. Maybe I should have added that, come to, I, I saw that question on the bottom there, but um, there is uh, what's called an attendant control. And, and typically, you know, attendant controls aren't necessarily needed if the person's using kind of that standard, you know, if there's a standard joystick on that, um, on the chair. But if somebody's using uh, an alternative joystick, one of the smaller joysticks or or a switch control like a head array or a sip and puff, obviously it's going to be uh, very difficult for the caregiver to maneuver the chair. Um, so th there is a attendant control joystick that can be mounted on the back of the, of the chair as well. I see. So are you saying that typically if someone's using a joystick, a caregiver could just stand alongside and um, can use that joystick and control the chair? Yeah. Yeah, typically. I mean, there are times. It just really depends on, on the situation. And so, um, you know, it depends on the different, different features um, that are included on the chair. Um, sometimes with particular features, the manufacturers will include the attendant control. Sometimes it's a, um, a separate upcharge. So, you know, it, if, it's, if it's an upcharged item and, you know, there's a, it's really kind of you know, it has to be determined whether it's medically necessary to have that um, attendant, attendant joystick. So it just it depends on what kind of the preference or, you know, what's, what's going on. You know, can, can it be controlled through the patient's driver controls or does it need to be, be separated out? It needs to be a so separate that, device. That uh, just highlights the value of that evaluation there. Yes, absolutely. Um, another question probably related to uh, the first one. Uh, can I adapt my current power wheelchair from joystick drive to driving with my head? And I w most of the time I would say yes, but it really depends on um, the type of wheelchair that you currently have. If it's a um, a more basic wheelchair with what we call non-expandable electronics, um, then you cannot adapt, you cannot put alternative drive controls like a head control on, on those. If you have um, the more what we call a re rehab style uh, chair like our group three or a little bit higher end power wheelchair with expandable electronics, then abs absolutely. And that's one of the things that um, is important with um, conditions that are um, progressive is that the, uh, the therapist and the supplier should be recognizing that um, and they should be providing that, that group three base with expandable electronics that will allow for those adaptations in the future. So without knowing the type of chair and the type of electronics, I can't say yes or no, um, but again, that would be something that you'd want to talk to the clinician or the person that supplied the, the wheelchair. I see, I see. So again, that goes back to that evaluation. If, if we anticipate that there's going to be a need to make changes to the wheelchair, we want to be aware of that up front so at least we have the capability um, in that initial chair to be able to expand if we think there's the potential for maybe changing how you drive the chair or, or maybe adding a, a vet tray or something of that nature. Is, is that, would you say that's yes. accurate? Yes. Great, great. Um, okay, thank you. Um, a comment here. Thank you. Once I started tilting back, then reclining, it really worked for me. Um, oh, great. That's well, very, very important. <laughs> so, I, and you know, that seemed like a simple thing. You know, when we want to recline, we probably just go straight to reclining. But I uh, was caught up as you were describing the process and why it was really important to tilt back first and then recline. Um, so thank you. And that, that comment, uh, apparently someone had figured that out. And appreciate oh, the comment. Um, are there any other questions? I know that we have gone um, long over 
because we had some technical difficulties launching our webinar today. Thank you for your tolerance and patience. This entire webinar has been recorded and the slide deck will be available. Um, please allow about 24 hours for us to get that to you. And again, if you would submit your name and email address in the chat box, I would be pleased to send you a link to that directly. Otherwise, you can uh, reach the link at the ALS Association National website, alsa.org, or you can reach out to your local ALS Association chapter. And Dr. Lucas has put his contact information here on the screen. If you have any other questions, uh, certainly can reach out to him directly. Um, we're grateful for, way for you sharing your time today and um, all of the folks at, at Pride um, Quantum Rehab really appreciate your efforts in uh, assisting the ALS uh, community in fo to at. So I'd like to thank you again for your time with us this afternoon. Best wishes to all who've joined us for a safe and enjoyable year-end season. Thank you.